Good morning, dear ICV members, colleagues from global vaccine community, and all of the attendees. I'm Shan Lu from the International Society for Vaccine and one of the co-chairs for ICV Virtual Congress series on COVID-19 vaccines. I will host today's program along with other ISV officers and fellows. As of today, the ongoing pandemic has infected more than 14 million people worldwide, with over 600,000 lost their lives. The need for a safe and efficacious COVID-19 vaccine is becoming even more urgent. It's the honor and also the obligation for ISV as the only global society for vaccine professionals to organize this mini symposium series. We hope to provide an open, scientific, and balanced platform to accelerate the development of a wide variety of COVID-19 vaccines and promote global collaboration. Next, my co-chair, Professor Linda Klavinsky, will introduce the design of our Congress. Linda, please. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are around the globe. So on behalf of my fellow co-chairs and the entire board of the International Society for Vaccines, I'd like to warmly welcome you to the second ISV Virtual Congress on COVID-19 vaccine development. So the concept of this virtual meeting stems from the fact that the ISV took the decision to pause our annual face-to-face -face, uh, vaccine congress, which was due to, to occur in Quebec City this autumn, and we decided to defer it to September 2021. But in its place, we've initiated a series of monthly virtual meetings over the summer that will provide a balanced update of progress in the development of a safe and efficacious vaccine to control the COVID-19 pandemic. A recording of the first ISV virtual congress that was held last month is available on our YouTube channel. Please look for International Society for Vaccines, or you can find uh, you can find the link to uh, the recording via our website. Please look at look for ISVcongress.org. So today is the second meeting. We've invited vaccine developers from biotech and pharma, as well as leading immunologists, virologists and policymakers to share their collective knowledge to the wider global community. In later meetings, members from NGOs and academic vaccine developers will also be We're delighted that over 2,300 delegates have registered from across the globe for this meeting uh, today. Time zone differences do make finding an optimal time for these events tricky, but we found from the first uh, virtual congress last month that the early morning, morning start on the west coast of the American continent and the nighttime start in Southeast Asia was an acceptable compromise. But should you miss any part of, the, of our, our virtual meeting, a recording will be a We've kept the duration of each Congress down to three hours. I appreciate how busy everyone is, but we feel that three hours is enough to give bite-sized chunks of specialist overviews of important developments in the field. Can I please remind the chairs and also speakers to keep to your time allocation so that we, can, so that we have time to take a few questions at the end of each presentation. And delegates, please submit your questions for the presenters via the live session chat box facility. So a little overview of the meeting. Each meeting has been organised into three sessions. There's an overview session where two leaders from the field of virology, public health or from an NGO give their assessment of where the COVID-19 field stands in key areas such as epidemiology, the organisation of clinical trials, regulatory affairs and also base the basic sciences underpinning the vaccine designs, etc. A second session is dedicated to updates from the vaccine developers themselves with a focus on four different vaccine platforms for each meeting. And again, I'd like to stress that we are committed to balance the contributions from biotech with pharma and also from academic teams over the coming months and also to provide representation from vaccine developers across the globe. And lastly, the final session is intended as a lively panel discussion where specific issues that pose a potential challenge to the COVID vaccine development field are debated by an esteemed panel of world leading experts. So please do stay on for this. Now let me hand you over to my 
my fellow co-chair, Professor Sean Liu. Thank you, Linda. So let's start the first session, the opening session. We have two keynote speakers. Uh, the chair would be Dr. Denise Dolan from James Cook University, Australia. She is a fellow of ISV and also the president-elect of ISV. Denise. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the opening session of the second ISV virtual conference and a great pleasure to introduce the first speaker who is Dr. Lawrence Corey, who is a past president and director of the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Centre and professor of its Vaccine and Infectious Disease Division. He is also a professor of medicine and laboratory medicine at the University of Washington and has been PI on the HIV vaccine testing network since its inception in 1999. Larry is an internationally renowned expert in virology, viral immunology and vaccine development. It's a great pleasure to introduce his talk on COVID vaccine planning, the USG approach. Welcome, Larry. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Denise. It's a real pleasure to be here um, and uh, an honor to be giving this keynote address. So if we could um, move to the next slide. My goal today is to sort of just give a uh, what I hope is an optimistic overview um, about uh, the, the developing of a SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. <clears throat> there is a, an extensive program in the U.S. government um, that uh, is associated with this, and I um, think well, we'll sort of review the overall development and the thoughts going uh, through this. <clears throat> I think for most of us who are working in HIV, um, we have at least have in COVID-19 an infection in which uh, the human does cure infection more than 95% of the time. Um, the degree of uh, genetic variation is uh, really averaging at the moment only two base pairs per month. Uh, <clears throat> and fortunately, there's been some variation in the spike protein, but not appears to be at the binding sites of, um, of attachment wherever the vaccine so far have been developed. Uh, we don't have latency. Um, we certainly have a formidable disease. Um, and uh, an infection of both epithelial and endothelial cells, um, which has made it a, um, uh, a, a disease of sort of at times protean manifestations uh, through the human body. But the object is to block both epithelial and probably we also need to block endothelial cell and uh, type 2 uh, pneumocyte infection. Next slide. <clears throat> um, Almost all the vaccines, at least in the U.S. government program, um, have been uh, developed and looking at the spike protein um, illustrated here. Actually, this slide is borrowed from uh, John Muscola. We could show the next slide um, looking at the spike protein. Um, <clears throat> the receptor is the human ACE2 receptor, um, <clears throat> both an interesting receptor with respect to distribution uh, throughout the body. Uh, a receptor that <clears throat> may actually be induced by the virus uh, in the nasal epithelium. Uh, next slide. Um, but the goal of uh, the vaccines has really been to induce uh, neutralizing antibodies that block attachment to the receptor. And that is essentially the con conceptual framework between the vaccine program and um, <clears throat> also a concomitant monoclonal antibody program, which um, uh, is ongoing. Uh, and uh, I, I sort of view those two programs mechanistically as being uh, synergistic in the, uh, in the issues of trying to develop uh, COVID vaccines, telling us uh, what levels of neutralization, as well as what does neutralization do uh, uh, as a means of preventing acquisition of infection, uh, as well as progression of disease. Next slide. Now, in general, there has been concern in the scientific community, uh, com community about COVID-19 vaccines, both with respect to antigenic drift, and uh, uh, we'll look at that. And um, I think at the moment, uh, uh, with a very formidable, um, you know, over 10 million people infected, um, <clears throat> we're seeing only, um, you know, minor amounts of antigenic drift. And there also has been concern about the issue of immune enhancement. Uh, immune enhancement has been seen in animal coronaviruses. It's also seen in no animal models of um, post-vaccination. It's been in, seen in some. Um, there has been no evidence in humans in SARS-CoV-1 or MERS, but one can look at that and say we haven't seen extensive epidemics like we have with uh, SARS-CoV-2. 
Um, <clears throat> there's been a, a series of consensus papers on this, um, um, looking at the pathogenesis. Next slide. Um, uh, first, the, the issue of antigenic drift. This is uh, uh, from uh, Trevor Bedford's website uh, as of the other day. Uh, looking at the viruses between March 30th, uh, the y-axis looking at the prevalence and the viruses that are circulating at the moment on uh, July 14th. Uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, relatively current uh, as of a week ago. And one can see there certainly is some antigenic drift, but when we look at the spike protein, um, you do see this uh, uh, mutation uh, at the uh, over on the right in the spike protein, but the kind of extensive mutation that we see in HAV has not been seen here in, uh, in the receptor bind binding site. And I think just, just sort of a, <clears throat> uh, a depiction of the approximately two antigenic shifts we're being per, per month. And, um, you know, at least this, this uh, degree of antigenic shift is uh, at the moment, fortunately, not looking like it's um, <clears throat> the vaccines that are currently designed are going to have problems with circulating strains. And even from phase one studies of the <clears throat> Moderna studies and the Pfizer published studies, the, the, the neutralizing antibodies um, appear to um, be able to neutralize circulating strains um, uh, at the moment of COVID-2. Next slide. As far as vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease, um, the mechanisms um, can be conceptually, um, I think, put into two buckets, uh, one in which uh, non-neutralizing antibodies um, uh, result in complement activation in the small airways, and the other ones in which uh, Th2 biased responses um, give increased inflammatory and impaired cytolytic function, with and eosinophils, neutrophils, and alveolitis and mucus producing airway hypersensitivity. Like I say, um, <clears throat> you can induce this in some animal models, um, uh, mainly of CoV-1. There have been occasional animal models of um, uh, natural occurring coronavirus disease. Um, <clears throat> whether we will see this or not in, um, in the human clinical trials will re require um, that evaluation. It is one reason in the studies that we have designed uh, evaluating efficacy studies in um, the U.S. government programs that we've made. Uh, next slide, we made the studies approximately 30,000 persons per trial. Um, <clears throat> this is a, a slide from Peter Gilbert that actually uh, looks at the hazard ratio of elevating, of detecting an ele elevated rate of severe COVID-19 in vaccine versus placebo recipients over 12 months in um, in a typical 30,000 person trial, which you have a two to one ratio of um, vaccine recipients to 10,000 enrolled placebo recipients. If there's a relative risk of three, even with a very uncommon rate of uh, 0.1, uh, 0 0.1 annual incidence or 0.1%, um, we had a very high ratio of picking up a, um, a relative risk of three. Less for a relative risk of two, you would need a, um, uh, an incidence rate of 0.5% uh, that you would be in the high 90s or 0.4% uh, in, uh, in the 90s and up to 0.2%. So one of the reasons we've made the trials relatively large is to be able to detect this on an individual trial basis as well as, um, uh, uh, as, well as an overall basis. But it is one of the reasons why control clinical trials for the valuation of these vaccines is, is necessary if we are going to pick up um, these kind of low incidence uh, safety events. Next slide. Now, the conceptual framework for the COVID-19 vaccine development is um, really based on the fact that multiple vaccine platforms are needed. Um, and much of that relates to that there is no single vaccine platform that can be manufactured at enough scale to immunize the entire um, adult population of the world, which is 4.4 billion. There's lots of data to say that children um, uh, should be vaccinated, uh, both respect for themselves as well as transmission to teachers and other adults. So really the, the task that we have um, in even the USG program is not just to vaccinate the 330 million people in the United States, and the 220 million adults, but is, it is really that we are all global citizens. We have a global economy 
and we actually need to um, uh, all be involved in uh, in both the scientific discovery, the scientific evaluation, and the uh, essentially administration and utility of the vaccine. Um, <clears throat> it is a global epidemic, and we need a global solution. So um, the issue of there is is therefore looking at this issue that the goal needs to be not to have a race like the like the the uh, press is depicting it, but really is to have uh, a very thoughtful program with respect to how do we license in, um, uh, multiple vaccines, uh, evaluate them, evaluate them, their safety, um, their their efficacy, uh, the populations in which they best work, um, and how to deploy them um, with a scientifically based um, program to vaccinate um, not just the US population, but uh, the entire global population. And this requires um, really coordination, maybe an unprecedented coordination to test, manufacture, and vaccine at scale and deliver the vaccine into people's arms throughout the world in a way that is as quick, uh, but yet as effective and not cutting any corners uh, with respect to safety or evaluation of, that, uh, of effectiveness. Next slide. So the program has really been um, one that um, <clears throat> has evaluated a series of platform technologies. Um, this is well known to this group of people, uh, the traditional protein vaccines. Um, later on, Greg Glenn is gonna talk about the Novavax uh, um, uh, platform. Um, there is a bacular virus um, uh, platform uh, by, with a prefusion complex made by Sanofi. They're both RNA and DNA technologies in the program. Um, the RNA vaccines, uh, again, uh, um, on this program, um, it's, they are being discussed. Um, Moderna and Pfizer are involved in that. Uh, Anovio is involved in a DNA technology. There are viral vector vaccines. Um, the chimp ad um, uh, should have been on this slide. <laughs> thought it was, uh, as well as the ADD26 vector, um, and there is a live viral VSV vector coming up, uh, looks like being developed uh, between IAVI and Merck. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> how do we organize ourselves to, to, to develop these platforms? Um, um, that's the next slide, we'll go, go into this. Um, next slide. Uh, <clears throat> we developed this plan um, with John Mascola and with working with Tony Fauci and uh, Francis Collins um, to uh, essentially develop a, a series of individualized, randomized control vaccine efficacy trials um, that are harmonized. Um, we knew that the manufacturing times of these vaccines would all come off at different times um, and that it was best to not wait for all of them to be together and put them into a, a plat what is a sort of a platform test um, background of using uh, starting them all at the same time and doing it comparatively, but to do individualized trials um, that would um, allow the more rapid development and and <clears throat> and frankly the more rapid development of of each individual um, uh, vaccine. Next slide. So. Um, the, the way to harmonize that was to have a um, uh, collaborating clinical trials network, uh, um, centralized labs that would define the endpoints, define the immunology, define any correlates of risk that would, would occur um, with respect to the assays that would be done, whether they be binding antibody assays, pseudovirus neutralization assays, live virus neutralization assays, um, and any T cell response assays. Um, we would have a common DSMB um, <clears throat> that would be able to um, evaluate things both individually as well as between trials, and also would be a DSMB that uh, when it felt that the potential of a correlate of protection could be derived, um, i.e. when two vaccines seem to work, um, did they have the same mechanism and could we come up with a correlate? that would allow bridging of subsequent uh, trials, uh, allow rapid, more rapid bridging into children, and frankly, may also um, help um, uh, future vaccines with respect to uh, not having to do randomized controlled trials uh, if we actually get a mechanistic uh, uh, correlate. We would also have a between trials uh, independent statistical group to, to evaluate such a thing. So that's the basic design. Um, 
of what has been called uh, Operation Warp Speed um, uh, and uh, of the US government. Next slide. I'll go, the harmonized protocols are each with a single candidate versus placebo um, that provide comparability and standardization in the critical elements of vaccine evaluation. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Gruber will talk about um, the FDA guidelines associated with this. Um, the protocol generally has a sample size of 30,000 per trial in either a one-to-one -one or two-to-one design. And again, we have a common assays for defining cases, common laboratories for validating the immune response, a common NIH um, supported DSMB, uh, independent stat biostatisticians to, um, to look across the trials for correlates of protection um, and the participation in the governance of each individual trial through a trial oversight committee that um, has not only company representatives, but US government representatives. Next slide. Um, <clears throat> Uh, as the initial targets of the five initial large pharma vaccine approaches are to the spike protein, um, it's my personal opinion to the ability to define a correlate is high if we use centralized laboratories and do these immune response antibody measures real time. So far in the non-human primate data, um, it looks like um, both for the RNA vaccine and the AD26 vaccines that um, correlate of protection in non-human primates appears to be neutralizing antibody. And we're hoping that <clears throat> that happens just like um, uh, what looks like is going on with uh, the NH, uh, NHP program and HIV, that there's a, uh, a correlation between the level of neutralization and, and acquisition of infection and prevention of disease. If two or more trials show a similar correlate, we can essentially define a surrogate marker of protection, and this makes subsequent vaccine development considerably easier. If the monoclonal antibodies actually work, uh, this uh, surrogate marker of protection could potentially be a, essentially a mechanistic marker um, uh, and uh, lead to, again, much more rapid development. This may not be the case for all population groups, um, and that's important for us to remember that, um, and we'll need to define this empirically. Next slide. As far as doing the trials, um, next slide. Um, <clears throat> when I say this is sort of unprecedented in, in time, um, I do mean this. Um, there are uh, at the moment five planned efficacy trials uh, in the warp speed program. Uh, <clears throat> the first one, the RNA vaccine trial by Moderna is due to start approximately next week, a week from today. Um, followed th that uh, in mid-August uh, by the AstraZeneca um, chimp ad um, uh, vaccine, uh, two-dose regimen uh, from, from Oxford. The, <clears throat> data were just uh, published yesterday in the Lancet uh, from the phase one, two trial. Um, Hanukkah is going to um, talk about the Johnson uh, Janssen program, uh, which is due to start in mid-September. Um, uh, Glenn is going to talk about the Novavax program I have here listed uh, um, uh, in mid-October. Uh, mid That's uh, uh, might be a, a week or two sooner. Uh, and uh, the Sanofi phase three trial is scheduled um, sort of in the um, end of November. So <clears throat> we have here uh, five 30,000 person trials um, that are um, being designed in, in pretty rapid succession. Next slide. So how do we carry these off? Um, well, <clears throat> we have taken uh, essentially the resources of um, uh, the networks that have been working in HIV and respiratory disease um, over those last 20 years and put them together into a COVID prevention network that we call that I co-lead with Kathy Newsel. Um, there's also um, taking on the monoclonal antibody prevention trials that Mike Cohn from the University of North Carolina and David Stevens from uh, Emory University are coordinating. Next slide. Just to say the deployment in the United States, um, <clears throat> these are actually the, the a map of the 87 sites. Uh, this is the COVID vaccine um, prevention network working with the companies and their clinical research studies. And uh, for the <clears throat> Moderna site, we have a, approximately 87 um, clinical trial sites in 74 counties in the United States. Um, the color coding here is uh, probably three a week, three or four weeks ago as far as where the current outbreaks are. Um, there are more extensive outbreaks. Um, this map gets uh, evaluated essentially uh, almost daily. Um, but you see that there's 
very nice overlap between the clinical trial sites and where um, uh, you know surge activity is. I think the United States is at a, is at a position where it has endemic COVID activity, um, and I think that the endemic COVID activity, um, uh, I guess I could say, almost essentially assures our, our, our ability uh, to be able to uh, define the efficacy of these vaccines over the next, uh, uh, <clears throat> certainly over the next few months. Next slide. I think one of the <clears throat> important issues is to understand the, um, the disease burden and for us to enroll the correct communities because the primary endpoints in most of these studies, in fact, all of them, is amelioration of disease, not just amelioration of infection. Um, <clears throat> it is well known, certainly in the United States and throughout the world, that patients age 60 and above account for approximately 60% of hospital and ICU admissions <clears throat> and almost 90% of the deaths uh, while representing 20% of the population. Patients with pre-existing uh, conditions are six to seven times more likely to be hospitalized and more than 10 times more likely to die than pa uh, patients without pre-existing conditions and that communities of color are overrepresented in cases and deaths um, many more fold and I think the right hand side is an important slide because it um, really looks at um, uh, Caucasian versus Black and, and Latinx um, populations in the United States. You see almost a 10 to eight times higher risk of um, death rates and hospitalization in Black and Latinx in the 30 to 40 year old, 40 to 50 year old, uh, 50 to 60 year old. You only see um, <clears throat> the sort of leveling of the curves at um, uh, essentially over 80, uh, over 70. So um, when it comes to enrolling these trials, I think one of the real issues here is that uh, we need to make sure that we get into uh, our minority communities who have uh, suffered the most from this epidemic. And this is one of the great challenges um, uh, of these uh, clinical trials, both scientifically uh, in order to get the right population to show differences in disease progression, as well as um, <clears throat> from a, uh, a overall evaluation point of view. Uh, these trials need to be multi-generational. They need to be multi-ethnic. They need to reflect uh, the diversity of the United States population, and they need to um, also be inclusive uh, <clears throat> uh, of the populations that have um, been affected by COVID-19 in our country. Next slide. I think one of the interesting issues that we're facing <clears throat> is what representation of population is important for the primary analysis and for the final analysis, and what is the balance between recruitment speed and the necessity to increase rep representation of subpopulations. And <clears throat> how do we do this in the context of wanting a rapid answer, but yet needing a trial that has utility, veracity, and shows safety? Um, and um, those are some of the kinds of adjustments that the Clinical Trials Network need to, to have and to work with. We've had a lot of experience with uh, enrolling um, minority communities, and we need to run the trials so that um, we are able in the end to have a representative population um, to see if, if, um, if the vaccines have appropriate efficacy. Next slide. <clears throat> the challenges. Um, um, these are sort of sort of the campaigns uh, that we're getting out. We know that there's issues with um, uh, uh, trust about vaccines, trust in communities, um, and how do we build that trust? Um, we do need over 100,000 volunteers ready to roll up their sleeves by the end of 2020. Next slide. Um, the networks are starting both in social media and the general media. Um, these are some of the early bylines. Um, Maybe one of the more fun things about this job of running a network is uh, getting to think creatively with people who do this to look at um, how do we get to the populations um, and um, work with them uh, to get them involved in these trials. Um, hope is, is good, help is better, join the fight against COVID-19, join the most important cause in the world, be a hero, become a vaccine volunteer. These are just some of the early sort of um, boards that people will start seeing in the next couple of weeks on social media and, and other kind of media. Next slide. Uh, we have set up a website, www.coronaviruspreventionnetwork.org. Um, 
uh, within the it went up about uh, 12, 14 days ago. There are 150,000 people in the United States who have already filled out the website. The well the website's been built with uh, uh, work between the um, Department of Human Health Services and Oracle. Um, <clears throat> it is um, uh, highly secure. It has medical uh, information and allows um, people to sign up uh, by their zip code and get referred to the clinical trial sites um, uh, with the kind of risk factors that are associated with um, um, uh, being enrolled in trials. Next slide. Um, again, a few billboards of um, uh, how do we end the uncertainty? Um, um, uh, how do we go back to living? And these are just some of the visual images um, that are going out to actually help facilitate enrollment and um, in, in, in essentially announcing the vaccine program throughout the United States. Next slide. I'll end there. Um, uh, Thanking uh, my colleagues, I've already named in the uh, of the COVID VPN Executive Committee, um, uh, my colleagues at the NIH uh, at the Vaccine Research Center. Uh, pleasure worth working with John Mascola, Barney Graham, and Julie Ledgerwood. Um, and uh, again, for the enormous support we get from um, Tony Fauci, Francis Collins, and uh, Doug Lowy, who um, chairs the active vaccine subcommittee. So um, thank you very much for the ability to talk and hope I've given you a little bit of an overview of, um, uh, of the program that is um, being rolled out in the United States. Okay, thank you very much, Larry. That was a wonderful talk. Uh, in the interest of time, we've only got time for one question, but one of the ones that's been posted is, could you please comment on the consequences of vaccinating individuals who have recovered from COVID or who are asymptomatic and infected but not actually tested for virus neutralizing antigens, antibodies or the presence of virus? Yeah, well, of course, we don't know at the moment. Um, the first um, couple trials, we're not doing screening, um, serological screening. You know, they're pretty good assays now to the nuclear protein that will allow us to differentiate vaccination from infection. Um, the trials are powered so that um, uh, we're allowing up to 15% of uh, COVID positive persons get vaccinated. We actually want to sort of see if um, um, what's the safety of that, that we prefer not to have serological screening before uh, widespread vaccination, see if that's safe. Um, so I, I guess the, the answer is, is um, it's a good question. We don't really know the answer. We will find that out in the context of the trials. Great. Well, good luck with everything. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so we will now move on to the second speaker in the session, which is Dr. Marion Gruber. Dr. Gruber is the Director of the Office of Vaccine Research and Review at the US FDA at the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Um, in this position, she oversees the planning, development and administration of national and international programs, providing leadership and direction to the day-to-day -day management of the Office of Vaccine Research. And um, she's very has a lot of experience in the um, research and regulatory activities and guidance and overseas of reviews and monitoring and evaluation of investigation on new drug um, applications and IND applications and biological license applications and supplements. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Gruber, who will be talking on US FDA regulatory considerations in the development and licensure of COVID-19 vaccines. Thank you, Dr. Gruber. Well, thank you for the kind introduction, and it's a pleasure to be here and give you an overview of the US FDA regulatory considerations in the development and licensure of COVID-19 vaccines. Can I have the next slide, please? So what I would like to do over the next 20 minutes or so, talk a little bit about the FDA response to COVID-19, tell you a little bit about the biologics law that govern vaccine development and approval in general, talk about vaccine development strategies and some unique consideration pertaining to COVID-19 vaccine development, and then I'll give you a, a high-level overview of the guidance for industry that we recently published uh, entitled Development and Licensure of Vaccines to Prevent COVID-19. Um, next slide, please. So the FDA 
in general um, engages in extensive interagency discussions on medical products in general. Of course, this includes vaccines and diagnostics for COVID-19, and we engage in efforts to support development of and access to these products. So our general activities really focus on providing guidance to sponsors to expedite initiation of clinical trials, not only of investigational COVID-19 vaccine candidates, but also other products. And we try to provide timely advice and interactions with uh, our stakeholders we try to ensure that clinical trials are appropriately designed to assess safety and effectiveness to support the eventual licensure of this product. And um, for products uh, against uh, or therapeutics and, and other products in general, we uh, try to also look into generating sufficient data to support access to investigational products before perhaps safety and effectiveness is, is, is established or before um, the, the product is licensed. Next slide, please. So we also engage in extensive international collaboration, including also the WHO that I did not list on the slide, but I just wanted to point out that we really collaborate with other regulatory agencies across the globe regarding the development of COVID-19 vaccines. For example, we have periodic meetings to share information about investigational COVID-19 vaccine candidates with other national regulatory authorities and uh, for which we have appropriate confidentiality arrangements. And we also participated in global regulator meetings under the auspices of ICMA to map out data requirements and to reach global regulatory alignment as feasible uh, for first in human clinical trials and phase three safety and efficacy studies. And we so far convened two of these meetings in March and in June of this year. Next slide, please. Um, so turning to the statutes and laws that uh, sort of um, um, give us the authorization to regulate um, vaccines, including COVID-19 vaccines. So these are contained in Section 351 of the Public Health Service Act. And it does state that we can license a biological product on the basis of demonstration that the product is safe, pure and potent. And potent really includes or has been interpreted to mean effectiveness. But evenly important, we have to have a facility that meets standards designed to assure that the product can be made uh, consistently and reproducibly and continues to be safe, pure and potent. So in other words, vaccines can be licensed if there is a demonstration that they're safe, and effective and that they can be manufactured in a consistent manner. Next slide. So we also have our CFR or Code of Federal Regulations that speaks to the fact that all indications that are contained in the package insert for a vaccine must be supported by what the law calls substantial evidence of effectiveness. And so there is an expectation that demonstration of effectiveness is based on adequate and well-controlled clinical studies. Next slide, please. So for vaccine or the, the vaccine development strategy in general and the data that are required to support licensure include the following. First of all, we need to have a manufacturing process that is established and refined to ensure product quality and consistency of manufacture. That's a very important concept. We need product related data and testing plans that are adequate to support the manufacturing process in appropriate facilities. We usually need some non-clinical data in animal models or in vitro studies to support um, the safety and effectiveness uh, or the non-clinical safety and effectiveness of the product. And these studies are usually conducted prior to or in parallel with clinical development. And it's a little bit of a case by case as to the extent to which these studies are required. And of course, we need human clinical data that are adequate to support the proposed indication and use of the product. And I already sort of mentioned that we need facilities that are compliant with good current manufacturing uh, practices. And very often there is, of course, a post licensure pharmacovigilance plan that is required to really look at the safety 
of the product once it's licensed. Next slide, please. This shows you the same thing, um, you know, in, in form of a cartoon. The point that I want to make here is that the development of the manufacturing process usually parallels clinical development. And by the time that a product is studied in phase three clinical studies, and uh, by the time a BLA is submitted, a biologics license application is submitted, the manufacturing process is established and validated in terms of assays, final product specifications, and final formulation of the stability. Next slide, please. So how does it look for vaccines against uh, COVID-19 for the SARS-CoV-2 virus? As already was discussed, there are many different vaccine candidates and constructs that are based on different platforms and uh, including DNA, RNA vaccines, protein subunit vaccines, etc., as shown here on, on the slide. And as was also discussed, that most of these vaccine candidates target parts or all of the viruses spike protein. Next slide, please. So because of the pandemic and because of the urgency to really have uh, vaccines, uh, licensed vaccines that are safe and effective as soon as possible, there are right now very compressed clinical development timelines for these products. And manufacturers really use adaptive or seamless clinical trial designs that would allow for more rapid progression through the usual phases, phase one, two, and three of clinical development. But what I'm trying to sort of show here on and down, uh, at the bottom of the slide is that there is some risk that the manufacturing process development lags somewhat behind clinical development. And all aspect of product manufacturing and validation will likely not be completed by the, by the time that at least some of the vaccines enter phase three clinical trials. And so that means that some validation operations may need to be completed after product approval, provided, of course, that product quality is not uh, compromised. And then I already spoke a little bit to the non-clinical studies that are conducted prior to or in parallel to clinical trials. And I'll get to this in a minute in a bit more detail. Next slide, please. So what are the considerations in COVID-19 vaccine development? First of all, of course, safety. And um, um, the, the other speaker already talked about the potential risk for vaccine-associated enhancement of disease. And of course, we don't really know if this will be holding true for, for, for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It has, as was mentioned, been observed in animal models post-vaccination with other coronaviruses. And uh, but But again, uh, we, we have to be looking at this potential risk. And then, of course, there is the call for adequate safety evaluation of these vaccines because they will be widely deployed. Um, we need to look at clinical disease endpoint efficacy trials, as was already discussed, uh, to really demonstrate the effectiveness of these products. And then, of course, I already spoke to the manufacturing considerations. Next slide, please. So to really capture some of these concepts, uh, we have in June of 2020 um, published a FDA guidance for industry entitled development and licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19. And we hope that this guidance will facilitate or help facilitate the timely development of safe and effective vaccines to prevent COVID-19. This guidance document in so many ways does reflect advice that the FDA has been providing over the past couple of months to uh, companies, researchers, and other entities interested in developing COVID-19 vaccines. It describes our current thinking and current recommendations regarding the data needed to facilitate clinical development and licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19. And I would like to stress that we are really committed to support all scientifically sound approaches to attenuating the clinical impact of COVID-19. And my staff has been working tirelessly over the last couple of months to help facilitate these development activities. Next slide, please. So uh, the guidance document provides really an overview of key considerations to satisfy requirements um, regarding uh, chemistry, manufacturing and control information, non-clinical data, 
clinical data, and of course, uh, post-licensure safety evaluations. The guidance stresses that, given the current understanding of SARS-CoV-2 immunology, that the goal of development programs at this point in time should be to support traditional FDA approval by conducting clinical disease endpoint studies, in other words, directly evaluating the ability of the vaccine candidate to protect humans from SARS-CoV-2 infection and or disease. And Dr. Corey already spoke to this. Uh, next slide, please. So it's it's sort of divided in, 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 these, uh, in these sections that I just mentioned. Um, next slide, please. Um, and I wanted to just highlight some of these key concepts and key consideration in each area discussed uh, in the guidance, starting with the chemistry, manufacturing and control section. So the, this guidance stresses that COVID-19 vaccines that are licensed by the FDA have to meet the statutory and regulatory requirements for vaccine development and approval in general, and that includes being adequately characterized and manufactured in compliance with applicable standards. Now, COVID-19 vaccine development may be accelerated based on knowledge gained from similar products manufactured from the same well-characterized platform technology. And so with appropriate justification, some aspects of manufacture and control can be based on the vaccine platform in general. And in some instance, that can reduce the need for product-specific data in some aspects. And of course, there is a need for pre-licensure inspections of the facility before a product can be licensed and that in the current pandemic situation presents with some challenges and the agency has sort of come out and uh, and, and stated um you know how pre-licensure yes. inspections can be can be done here in in and in, in conducted during the COVID-19 public health emergency. Next slide please. Non-clinical studies in animal models can help identify potential vaccine related safety risk and can guide the selection and the dose, the regimen and the route of administration that is be used in clinical studies. But we also try to really employ a very flexible approach here and we stated that the extent of non-clinical data that are required to support proceeding to first in human clinical trials does depend on the vaccine construct supportive data available for the construct, as well as data from closely related vaccines. And in this context, the guidance includes recommendation regarding toxicity studies, characterization of the immune response in animal models, and also with regard to studies to address the potential for vaccine associated enhanced respiratory disease. Next slide, please. Turning to clinical key considerations now. So, we, Dr. Corey talked a little bit about the need to really inform and define immune correlates of protection as this may, um, you know, accelerate uh, vaccine licensure and clinical trials in the future. But given current lack of data to inform immune correlates of protection, we feel strongly that the development program should pursue traditional approval based on direct evidence of vaccine efficacy in protecting humans from uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection or disease. Um, we feel that clinical development programs may be expedited through adaptive and seamless clinical trial designs. But regardless of whether clinical development programs proceed in discrete phases with separate studies or via more seamless approaches, it is important to really gather adequate data, including data to inform the risk of vaccine associated enhanced respiratory disease as clinical development progresses from sort of early clinical stages to more advanced clinical trials. Next slide, please. The guidance talks a little bit about key considerations for trial populations and makes the point that as one starts clinical development and engages in these first in human clinical studies or other early phase studies that, that focuses to first enroll healthy adults and preliminary 
preliminary clinical safety and immunogenicity data for each dose level and age group should be collected and evaluated to really advance and to support clinical development and to initiate later advanced clinical trials. Late phase clinical trials, such as these phase three studies to demonstrate vaccine efficacy, will likely need to enroll many thousands of participants, as was just discussed, including subjects with medical comorbidities. And so in this regard, we think it's also important to enroll diverse populations that are most affected by COVID-19 in all phases of vaccine clinical development, and that would include racial and ethnic minorities. There are recommendations in the guidance uh, to really uh, just, uh, include data to support enrollment of elderly individuals and individuals with medical comorbidities, as well as subpopulations such as pregnant women and women of childbearing potential who are not actively avoiding pregnancy. And we are asking vaccine manufacturers to really tell us about their plans on including these subpopulations in later stage clinical trials. And there's also a short section in the guidance discussing assessments of, of COVID-19 vaccine in pediatric populations. Next slide, please. Um, trial design issues are being discussed and the point is made that early phase trials often, of course, have to aim to down select among multiple candidates and or dosing regimen. Um, later phase trials, including efficacy studies, should be randomized, blinded, and placebo controlled, which was already discussed. And the protocols that have adaptive designs need to specify the criteria for adding or removing vaccine constructs or dosing regimen. And protocols that have seamless trial designs need to include pre specified criteria for advancing from one phase of study to the next. Next slide, please. The, 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 the importance of efficacy endpoint was already discussed and uh, from our perspective, an, accept an acceptable primary efficacy endpoint is laboratory confirmed COVID-19 or laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2 infection that needs to be appropriately confirmed. We feel it is important to standardize efficacy endpoints across clinical trials because we think this facilitates comparative evaluation of vaccines for deployment programs and purposes. And as was discussed by the previous uh, speaker, there were there are multiple vaccines are really going into phase three clinical studies over the next couple of months. Next slide, please. So um, key statistical considerations, and there has been a long uh, discussion on these issues, but we feel that primary efficacy endpoint point estimates for a placebo controlled efficacy trial should be at least 50%. And that the um, adjusted confidence interval around the primary efficacy endpoint point estimate should be greater than 30%. And that these key statistical criteria should apply not only to final efficacy analysis, but also would apply to interim um, efficacy analysis, because of course, as sponsors start these phase three clinical studies, there's interest to really, um, because of the ongoing pandemic, to look at early signals of effectiveness. This criteria of at least 50% has been set to prevent or guard against a vaccine that has only low efficacy to be licensed. So that is sort of the major driving point for this for this consideration. And of course, it's also important for phase three clinical studies to include interim analysis to assess the risk of enhanced disease and even futility. Next slide, please. Um, the general safety evaluation, including the size of the safety database, should be no different than we really ask for other preventive vaccines. And subjects need to be followed up long enough to evaluate safety, the duration of immune response, as well as the risk of disease enhancement, as antibody may wane over time. But we anticipate, and you already heard about the size of these clinical trials, that they are really of sufficient size to provide an acceptable safety database. Of course, post licensure safety evaluation present an important consideration, and we recommend early planning of pharmacovigilance activities. Next slide, please. 
So to 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 close here. The, uh, in, in the last couple of slides, um, the guidance documents has some additional considerations. One of them is accelerated approval, and I wanted to sort of mention that briefly. That is a provision available in the US for products uh, that are to treat serious and life-threatening to diseases. And in these cases, approval may be based on adequate clinical trials that establish an effect on a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. But if we license a vaccine based on a surrogate endpoint that is likely to predict clinical benefit, then there is a requirement to verify the clinical benefit once the product is approved in the post-marketing space. Next slide, please. Now for COVID-19 vaccine, an accelerated approval may be considered in the future if a surrogate endpoint that is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit is established. But again, there are some caveats here because the applicability of the biomarker may, de may depend on the vaccine characteristics. And so a biomarker, let's say an immune parameter identified for a particular COVID-19 vaccine candidate um, may not be applicable to other COVID-19 vaccine candidates unless there is evidence that a single specific marker reflects the immunologic mechanism responsible for conferring protection against disease. And of course, such immune marker requires the availability of validated assays to reliably measure these antibodies that has also been discussed by the previous speaker. Next slide. And yeah, so we in the United States have a provision to make available products that have not been licensed, investigational vac vaccines and other products under the so-called emergency use authorization. Um, there are some requirements that need to be met, including some evidence that the known and potential benefits of a product would outweigh the known and potential risks of the product. And we feel that for a COVID-19 vaccine for which there's adequate manufacturing information, issuance of an EOA may be appropriate when studies have demonstrated that the vaccine is safe and effective, but before a biologics license application has been submitted or reviewed by the FDA. So in other words, in the case of investigational vaccines being developed for the pre prevention of COVID-19, an assessment regarding the use of this product under EOA and deployment of this product under EOA would be made on a case-by-case -case basis and we would consider the target population, the characteristics of the product and other data that would be available for the product. So to sum it all up, can I have my last slide please? COVID-19 vaccine will be approved based on data from adequate and well-controlled studies demonstrating the safety and the effectiveness of the vaccine construct. We need a uh, facility that is uh, demonstrated to be in compliance with current good manufacturing practices, and we need a manufacturing process that is established and validated and can assure product quality and consistency. We understand that each vaccine candidate, of course, has its own consideration, and we really value continued engagement with all our stakeholders because we think that's really important and, and critical to be successful in the clinical development and licensure of COVID-19 vaccines. And I end it here. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gruber. Um, appreciate that's a wonderful, wonderful perspective. Uh, in the interest of time, we've probably got only time for one question, but there's been a couple of questions posted on coordination with the WHO, particularly given the USA, US is withdrawing for WHO, and also organisations such as Gavi. So, would you like to comment briefly on those, please? Um, yeah, we have uh, been working with the WHO for for many years and. Um, uh, in many projects, in, uh, especially looking at making vaccines and other products uh, um, to prevent emerging infectious disease. And we actually have been engaging and we have been providing um, 
um, advice to um, WHO um, in this very difficult situation in, in the face of this pandemic. And uh, to the extent possible, uh, we make every effort to continue this collaboration. And we also engage, um, um, you know, in, 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 in other activities such as the active program under NIH. And we also, you know, um, participate to the extent possible in initiatives that Europe has, the Act, Accelerate, Act Accelerator. And of course, you know, uh, ZEPI, is an important partner in that. And there is our collaboration also then with Gavi. So we really try to, to engage and to interface and provide guidance where this is possible and, and still feasible. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Really appreciate that. So we'll close that opening session and hand over to the next session. Thank you very much for the excellent talks. Thank you. Thank you, the speakers, and uh, also uh, to Dr. Uh, Dolan. Mm -hmm.